This is it. The putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software? To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth. With visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budget, and more, NetSuite is everything you need to grow, all in one place. With NetSuite, you can automate your processes and close your books in no time while staying well ahead of your competition. 93% of surveyed businesses increased their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. Over 27,000 businesses already use NetSuite. And right now, through the end of the year, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financing program to those ready to upgrade at NetSuite.com slash C-Suite. Head to NetSuite.com slash C-Suite for special end-of-year financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses. NetSuite.com slash C-Suite. Welcome to The Drill Down, the business stories behind stocks on the move. I'm Corey Johnson, and today is Friday, June 18th. Well, just ahead, Adobe sees customers accelerating their digital businesses still. And gun sales for Smith & Wesson are through the roof, but is a nationwide ammo shortage impeding those sales? And we're drilling down on digital workflow leader ServiceNow, how it's positioned for growing competition in the cloud with our guest, Palio's CEO, Joe Greco. But first, it's sponsor time. The Drill Down is brought to you by Era, a one-stop equity platform where you can seamlessly connect to any earnings call and surface actionable insights automatically. Era's AI-powered tools will allow you to work faster and smarter. That's Era, A-I-E-R-A, dot com. And if you like this podcast, subscribe on your favorite platform, hit the follow button, and maybe leave us a review and let the rest of the world know what you think. And let us know what companies you think we should be drilling down on. Talk to us on Twitter and Instagram by following at DrillDownPod. And connect with us directly at our website, bizpod.net. I'm Corey Johnson. Welcome to The Drill Down. We're explaining the business stories behind Stocks on the Move. Joining me as always, executive producer Isaac Webster. Isaac, tell me the three most important developments in the world of business today. All right, Corey, let's get to it. Number one, the three main Wall Street indexes all finished sharply lower on Friday. Investors spooked by hawkish interest rate comments from Federal Reserve official James Bullard of St. Louis. Bullard said he now expects to see a central bank, central bank rate increase next year. Now, at the closing bell, the Dow posting its fifth straight session of declines, dropping over 500 points today. The index fell more than 3% on the week and its worst weekly performance since October. The S&P 500 extended losses to close lower by 1.3%, while the NASDAQ fell just under 1%. But if you look at those one-year numbers, it's not so bleak. The Dow is still up 27% over the past 12 months. Uh, The S&P up 33%. The NASDAQ higher by 41% over the last 12 months. Now, number two, we're watching Credit Suisse, Credit Suisse has backed away from lending to SoftBank and its founder, Mayoshi Sun. That's according to regulatory findings, uh, filings and people familiar with the matter talking to the Wall Street Journal. The move came after the collapse of SoftBank back, backed Greensill Capital in March, which plunged Credit Suisse into turmoil. It also follows Credit Suisse's $5.5 billion loss stemming from trading by the family office of Archigos Capital Management. The bank, Credit Suisse, has since promised to dial down risk. And number three, HSBC expects to take $3 billion in losses as part of an agreement to sell its unprofitable French retail bank in a sign of the souring fortunes for of European banking. London-based HSBC, of course, is one of the world's largest lenders, and it's said that it has agreed to sell the bank to a company owned by Cerberus Capital of New York. Corey, what stocks are you drilling down on today? Well, I want to take a look at Adobe. Adobe, A-D-B-E, shares have gained 33% in a year. What's going on with Adobe? Well, Adobe reported another terrific quarter. They told us that sales were up 23% over the same quarter last year. 
uh, to $3.8 billion. And a big part of that was their digital media business. That was about $2.7 billion of that. And that's a business that helps companies manage their identities and their businesses online. As you can imagine, during COVID, when everything was closed, that was pretty important for most of Adobe's customers. But it continues to be important. Uh, and there again, it's a discussion, Isaac, we keep having with so many companies where we keep hearing that the demand that might have happened over the next few years all happened in 2020. And CEO Shantun and Narayan of Adobe saying it's also happening, that acceleration of digital transformation happening in 2021. Uh, it was a strong quarter. And right through the pandemic, we've been talking about how the interest in our digital experience solutions and the belief uh, when I have conversations with CEOs across every single a vertical is that the only way to engage with customers is going to be digital. And I think people are starting to recognize that that investment is an investment uh, that they have to pay. So first, I think from a macro uh, perspective, it's clear that digital transformation and within digital transformation, customer experience management is front and center as something that they want to spend money on. So that, clearly that's what they're seeing and that's what they're seeing uh, continue. I think this, I'm hearing this phrase more than ever, this digital transformation phrase. Uh, lots of companies think that they've coined it themselves, but it really does seem to be sweeping Silicon Valley. And uh, hey, man, it, it was it was one of the biggest business trends of the last year. I mean, were we talking about digital transformation 10 years ago, though? Yeah, but it's the pace of that change. I mean, it, it is just, it is so accelerated. I mean, you you see it in the results of these companies, these companies that were growing perfectly fine at 10, 15 percent. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden you see them putting up these 23 percent right. quarters. I mean, that, that's a that's a great quarter. That's mm -hmm. one great moment for any company. But to have quarter after quarter like that, I think you really do see this acceleration where where the demand of 21, 22, 23, 24, the, you know, the next three, four years was all pulled into the last year. And it's going to be cool to see how real habits have changed. Since this last year. Yeah, and the second iteration or the second derivative of it, right? Once companies have made the transformation, then they really see, hey, we don't have to do it like this at all. That's That right. was how we adapted from non-digital to digital. We're taking our old business and making it digital. What if we just have a business that's digitally native and that next level of, of um, innovation could be really fun to watch. Corey, what is your next drill down? Let's look at Springfield, Massachusetts-based Smith & Wesson. They make guns, Isaac. Ah, uh, gun maker Smith & Wesson. SWBI. Shares have risen 12% year-to-date. What is uh, new with Smith & Wesson? This company is on an incredible roll. Their quarterly sales a year ago were $193 million. The quarter they just reported, $322 million. That's a 67% increase in revenues for the year, get this, for the year, their sales were $1.1 billion. It was literally and exactly double the previous year. I mean, uh, we're talking about sales of guns, yes. right? So COVID, so. <laughs> riots in the streets, protests in the streets, a oh. uh, Democrat getting elected uh, into the world we office, live in. Uh, the Democrats with the House and the Senate and a lot of state elections, and of course the presidency, That all those things uh, drove gun sales. Uh, quarterly uh, net income for this company went from $21 million a year ago to $89 million in the most recent year. They said it was the most successful year in the 169-year history of this company. And it could have been better if it wasn't for the persistent shortage of ammunition. I don't know if you know a lot of gun owners, but... Every gun owner I know talks to me about how hard it is to get ammo and how they're looking for ammo and they're hearing about people who've got ammo and running to stores to buy ammo. When the CEO of Smith & Wesson, Mark Smith, was asked if the ammo sales or the, the ammo uh, shortage had actually hurt their sales, uh, listen to what he had to say. Uh, we are hearing a little bit of, you know, pockets of folks being able to get a little bit of ammunition on the shelf, but I will say, you know, the general, the general answer is no, it's not getting any better. It's not getting any worse either. I think that's just kind of, you know, remains remains to be an issue. And I mean, I think, you know, the the, uh, the, the yin and the yang of that for us, you know, frankly, is that, you know, yeah, it, it can have a dampening effect on the firearm sales, but it also shows a, a pretty strong continued interest in shooting sports in general. So, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, that's a bit of a headwind for us in the firearm sales, but it's also a bellwether for the industry in general. 
I think he meant yin and yang, not ying and yang. But nonetheless, uh, a, a, a giant development, I think, the last year in gun sales in America. I'm so sorry to hear about the ammo shortage. Oh, I'm crying over here. Well, if you spend some money on a gun and you want to go target practice and you can't find ammo, what fun is that? There are plenty of ways to have fun. Corey, what is your next drill down? Let's look at Athera Pharma. Athera Pharma. Now, I don't, I'm not familiar with this company. A-T-H-A, though, is the ticker symbol, and shares have been taking a hit this year. Uh, indeed. Well, Athera Pharma is, shocker, a pharma company. Ah, Pharmaceuticals. Uh, yes, they are. In, <laughs> they're developing some new treatments for some big diseases, not least of which Alzheimer's. They've got two late stage clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease. Now, the treatment that they're using is based, at least in part, on the doctoral research of Athera Farmer's dynamic CEO, the 35 year old Lean Kawas. She earned her PhD in molecular pharmacology at Washington State University in 2001. Um, and here she was speaking at a Goldman Sachs conference just 10 days ago. Athera Pharma, we are a company that is focused on addressing huge and me medical neurological disorders. Uh, we have a platform of small molecules that uh, activates a naturally occurring repair pathway uh, where we expect a recovery of network functionality uh, neurotransmission, recovery of uh, synapses, and, and potentially even modulation of inflammation. So this type of multimodal approach is relevant to multiple indications, including Alzheimer's disease, which our most advanced program is uh, in uh, late stage clinical development in two trials that are currently uh, up and running and recruiting for mild to moderate uh, Alzheimer's disease. So Huge deal, and she's super impressive. She's 35 years old. She's a mother. She's a, and she is a star in the world of biopharma. She's one of the youngest CEOs of a biotech company, one of the rare women CEOs of a biotech, and, of course, well, this development, Isaac, she's no longer a CEO. What, what uh, happened? In a, in a surprise announcement, the board of Athera announced that it had placed Lena Kawas, Dr. Kawas, on a temporary leave – pending a, quote, review of action stemming from doctoral research Dr. Kawas conducted while at Washington State University. I wondered why you dropped her university <laughs> earlier, why you, why you plugged her university earlier. Now well, I know. Dr. Kawas gotcha. uh, will continue to function as a board member, and the okay. board's formed a special committee to undertake a review, an independent committee, they say. Uh -huh. um, I called the university. I emailed the university. I emailed, uh, 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 I've made a lot of calls to find out what the deal is. No one's talking. Um, they mm -hmm. didn't say what the issue was with that doctoral research. Um, I did find a paper that she wrote in 2015 uh, with two other people that uh, called the development of small molecule angiotensin four analogs to treat Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. I don't uh -huh. know if that's the, the doctoral research in question here. Uh, the company uh, did not respond also. They just said, I, I, I both emailed and called the company, and they just said that the company does not intend to comment further on this matter until the review has concluded. I'm just going to say that mystery is not good news. Uh, and, and Dr. Kawas's rising star uh, is taking a hit right now. Well, we'll definitely reach out to the company and see if they want to come on and talk about it. I already did, but maybe they'll change Great. their mind. Yeah. All right, coming up next, we're going to talk to one of our favorite guests, Palio CEO Joe Greco, uh, with an interesting look at ServiceNow. The Drill Down is brought to you by ERA. ERA's event access and monitoring intelligence platform improves earnings season and the investor events in between through comprehensive calendar tracking, one click event access, dynamic monitors, multicasting, and more. Powered by an advanced language processing engine, which consumes some 40,000 investor events annually across 10,000 global equities. Learn more at ERA, A-I-E-R-A dot -E com. And remember to join the Drill Down on Twitter and Instagram at Drill Down Pod. And check out our website, bizpod.net. Let us know what companies, what stocks we should be drilling down on. We're back on the Drill Down now with our guest, Joe Greco of Palio. Uh, Joe, glad to have you. As always, we've had you on before, and uh, uh, you've brought us some interesting stuff. ServiceNow is a company you brought us to take a look at, which is 
run by um, one of my favorite CEOs, uh, Bill McDermott, formerly of SAP. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting story that's been building for quite some time, even pre-Bill uh, with uh, Sleuthman and then, of course, uh, McDonough uh, previously, where they kind of went one direction. Um, you've got the gentleman who's now running Snowflake, uh, um, starting there and you had the ceo who ultimately would end up with ebay nike and in some pretty good positioning right john donahoe's career went went ebay service now and then nike interestingly yeah Yeah. and right in the middle i would say uh style wise personality wise bill shows up and really brings swagger back to everything that is uh that is service now today and this business has really uh, uh, grown at a fantastic clip. But let's back up before we get to that. What is the business of ServiceNow? They are a complete platform for delivering all sorts of uh, work function, workflow products and services, obviously, as a, uh, as a subscription. And they are absolutely a work smarter, not harder organization. So they deliver well, the real service and they deliver it now, which is Quite, uh, quite humorous given the name was picked well before the point where they are in their life cycle today. So specifically, um, they're talking about IT workflows, customer workflows. What, what, uh, explain what happened. So a, a, a Fortune 500 company, a Fortune 100 company, whatever, they bring in ServiceNow and ServiceNow does what for them? Yeah, they look at all of their functionality, some of the internal processes, uh, and then of course how they're engaging with their vendors, with their clients, with their production. And how are things getting out the door? How are they do? How are they meeting deliverable timelines? How are they getting out work product? How are they incorporating documents and contracts? And how are they delivering on whatever it is the work function is for that client? And they make sure to streamline and they deliver a whole platform that integrates seamlessly from end to end, so people can be so those clients can be on the platform and continue to grow instead of needing to bolt on external systems and platforms, which we all know. Uh, not only waste a considerable amount of time and resources, but also could be the death knell of a company that gets too mired in a multiple platform uh, 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 workflow process. Famously, the customers of IBM sometimes, right? Yeah. Where, yeah. Where, where, when it works, I don't, I don't want to throw shade in IBM for all of their work, but sometimes when it doesn't work, you hear these stories of armies or McKinsey, armies of consultants coming in, keep continuing to tell you how to change your workflows, but you end up just spending vast fortunes on those consultants not seeing the business improvements. You know, a big deal with those organizations, especially when they're so sales focused and client relation focused, you can't leapfrog above your superior. So whoever is your whoever your boss is, is the end of the line for you. It's a very militaristic uh, org chart. Here at ServiceNow, they have a model that is insanely flat. If you want to reach a level or two because you need to get something done and you know that person can help, there is absolutely open invitation to do so. And I've heard numerous stories where people have gotten things done at crazy hours from otherwise uh, C-suite individuals getting involved. And you wouldn't necessarily think that, that the C-suite would want to get involved in the day-to-day of, of landing the account or moving the business along, um, but they do. And they all do have a belief that their internal employees are their immediate customers, and therefore they've got to be there to help out. They've got to provide that service now the way they would really uh, if they were there. Yeah. Really, it, it's it's the truth. I really, I know right it's cheap. It. It's so cheap. It's so cheap. But that's the that's the You're humorous part. You're better than that, Joe. You're a better man than that. Come on, <laughs> I'm a I'm a girl dad, man. I gotta crack the, the dad jokes every now and then. Right, and I you know, it. yeah. I who who might have thrown <laughs> uh, stones in my glass house? Um, uh, as you look at these guys and look at what industries they're in, where are they focused? Uh, all over the map. I mean, they have retail. They have big tech. They have. Uh, government contracts. They, speaking of the government, they have the U.S. government, uh, not in its entirety, but certainly larger uh, contracts, and they are expanding. You know, they went from, I believe it was what they, what they call like the one SKU, one SKU model, to now they have a super SKU where they can focus very specifically and obviously grow profitability thereby on individual business units without stepping on each of the others. But they're also not out there just saying, hey, one fee gets you access to everything. Give me a dollar, you have access to everything. 
which you can subscribe for as well if necessary, but you can also parse it out. So they've become not only larger, but they've strategically gone, grown. So the platform is much more expandable and they can address uh, needs of, across, across just about every industry that's out there. It seems that there's a, it's hard for me to tell from the outside with companies like this, right? All of these companies in the enterprise software world will like to say it's the software, it's not the, the armies of people that come with it that make the things work. You know, some companies have been notorious about how, how bad the software was, but how they'd have to bill you a fortune to get it installed before you found out how bad it was. These guys seem to also have a combination of individuals who work with the companies who try to come up with better processes, but also a software sales process. Yeah, so I, I don't know of too many stories where clients suffer from that, either from an onboarding uh, latency or just service response time. It seems that even though as they finally eclipse the 10,000 employee mark, which is kind of like the mythical line in the sand, they they can still grow and expand without hurting the end product of service that they deliver. It seems as though they're still very much focused on aligning the interests of all their employees, empowering them and enabling them to reach across the different uh, communication channels internally to get the job done so they can deliver the product on time. And then also make sure that as they grow, everyone is incentivized to benefit thereby. They have one of the more robust um, benefits packages that I've seen, uh, certainly for in, in the tech space, where they really do want to make sure that the employees are sharing not just in stock, but dividend performance, and everybody wins alongside of each other. So there, there's, there's a little bit more of a selective uh, feel about how they bring people in, certainly in how they recruit the upper echelon of executives. That's a big business, too. They've got 13,000 employees or so. I think that's the number now. Yeah, so it, it does strike me that they start with a kind of a tech first notion of how to do things, of how to bring things onto a platform and how to use software to solve problems. Uh, not that anyone at their competitors is saying, you know, let's hand me a monkey wrench, let's fix this expense process. But it does seem to be a, a, a more cloud-based uh, tech uh, software first focus. It is. They recognize that they have to be there, and that's part of their moat that they continue to build and dig deeper and wider. Um, you know, they they were certainly visionary when they made the shift and started to analyze how they could integrate uh, artificial intelligence, what predictive analytics means to their business, and how strong that could make their product offering. Uh, their virtual agents and the chat box was something they were a little bit slow to get online, but now that that's up and and been cleaned up in in recent months it's all baked into the experience. So it's much smarter for them now to have that core offering that's wrapped in a fully cloud uh, functionality than it would be if they tried to build it uh, separately and apart from each other. So Bill McDermott comes in as CEO in November, 2019. Not a real good time, it turns out, to try to come with this company. Now, growth has continued on the top line, not as, you know, there was kind of at a 30 or 35% growth rate, now it's down to 30, which is still fantastic. But on a profit basis, these guys really took it on the chin. They put up some really rough quarters. Is this purely a COVID uh, uh, expense going on here or what's going on? They're, they are investing, I, I think it is. I think they recognize that they need to shift and there is gonna be certainly a come out of this for them that is much greater than if they don't make those consolidations now. And they are absolutely looking at uh, more strategic deals, making sure that they're all they all pass muster of additive to the platform and ex and making the platform more ex expandable. They understand that digitization brings them to a faster quote to cash initiative, which is what everybody's chasing, and they want to make sure that the platform remains as integratable as possible. I would put them on par with what Salesforce did, I would say two to three years ago, when they were really focused on expanding their reach and and had to spend a lot of money to get there. But the acquisition model that Salesforce is under now to bolt on and 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 then suffer the consequences of the expense there are are starting to uh, to show. I mean the Slack acquisition, I think McDermott is is quoted as saying he got the look at about one quarter or one fifth of the price that uh, that Benioff ultimately paid. So uh, with the notion that he missed or the notion that it wasn't worth it? No, the notion that it wasn't worth it, and he believes that culturally it's going to be a, a little bit more of a wrangle. Now, there is quite a bit, I don't, I don't know anyone in particular, but there's quite a bit of sentiment out there that says, 
that was probably a deal that was in the works since they were uh, pre-IPO, pre-direct IPO for for Slack. And it might have been, let's see how you do in the marketplace, and then we'll and then we'll talk more deeply. I believe there was an investment made previously. Yeah, well, they're definitely definitely close, and and the companies have some similar. We'll see how the integrations tough. Uh, Salesforce has been doing it well, it looks like, for a long time. But they need those things to keep growing. What does ServiceNow need to keep growing? Uh, AI. AI and predictive analytics are where it's at. They need to be just a half a second ahead of the click and an understanding of what their client needs so that way they could get ahead of the next request. If they can continue to put out the answer right as the question is being asked or hopefully even before it is it is asked, they're going to be in a much better shape. And that's going to that's going to be the protective moat around their service offering. All right. Well, Jill, this is such an interesting company. Uh, uh, we definitely want to keep an eye on service now going forward. How can our listeners keep in, in touch with what you are uh, doing and thinking about uh, with, with uh, your company? Sure. Well, definitely visit us at polioinc.com. That's P like Peter, A-L-I-O, Inc.com. We reach out on professional development and performance coaching initiatives. We liaise with a lot of executives and investment advisors right up to the family office uh, level. And recently, we've been working with folks who are certainly focused on expanding not only their foothold in, in their particular market, but their footprint at large to, uh, to make sure their leadership team is as equipped as they can be. All right. Great stuff, Joe Greco. Appreciate it. Well, up next on the Drill Down the Bite, the one number that tells us a whole lot. We talked about how much service now's customers seem to like the product. They've got about 1,200 customers. But how many of those renew every year? We'll give you the number of the renewal rate of ServiceNow customers right after this. The Drill Down is brought to you by Era, a one-stop equity platform where you can seamlessly connect to any earnings call and surface actionable insights automatically. Era's AI-powered tools will allow you to work faster and smarter. That's Era, A-I-E-R-A dot com. And we hope that you're listening to every episode of The Drill Down. So many of our listeners are and talk to us about how it's their go-to choice for business news every day. That's easier if you subscribe or if you click the follow button on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeart, TuneIn, Pandora. Catch every show. And let us know what companies you think we should be drilling down on. Talk to us on Twitter and Instagram by following at DrillDownPod. And connect with us directly at our website, bizpod.net. Okay, we're back to the drill down bite, that one number that tells us a whole lot. I mentioned that ServiceNow's uh, 1,146 total customers who are over a million dollars in uh, average customer value. But uh, specifically, all of their customers, the renewal rate for those customers, it's a sign of how much people like the ServiceNow business. Isaac, 97% of those customers are renewing these days. Uh, I think it shows they're getting something right. Wow, that's a sticky number. I mean, you know, I'd like to think that our listeners are sticking with us and Similar numbers. Are you comparing us to them? Sure. Yeah. It's only a matter of time till we do 1.4 billion in revenues. That's every right. Quarter. That's right. All right. Well, thank you for listening to the Drill Down. I'm Corey Johnson. Isaac Webster is our executive producer. The Drill Down is a production of the Business Podcast Network. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.